Hi everybody, Tim Krause again here doing a video with you. You know, this has been, it's been a little while since we did a video, uh, but I wanted to do a video today. Uh, we're, and we've covered this before in various videos or different videos, but I wanted to make sure that we did this. This today is going to be called God's Plan for Restoration and New Covenant. Now the reason we have to focus on this, or the reason we have to cover this is because it would it we hear message ministers talking about uh, the mosaic law and the regulations and the legalisms but and, and we go through this but it's a shame that they miss the opportunity to take advantage of the the new covenant that Jesus ushered in just as a reminder any links any videos anything like that that we do the description is going to be uh, full of the links that you can go out to my Google Drive and take a look at those so feel free to do that um, but just, we, we do the same methodology that we always use, that's Isaiah 28.10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We also are going to use 2 Corinthians 13, chapter or verse 1, uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So that's how we're going to do this video today moving forward. Well, when I was attending a, an assembly, a message assembly, uh, which followed the end time message of William Branham, the pastor didn't really encourage studying the scriptures. It's more of a, you know, play a sermon every day, read a, read a sermon every day, read a Branham sermon, a message sermon every day, but it really didn't encourage reading the scripture because they wanted the, the scripture to come through a Branham lens or a Branham filter, so to speak. So I really didn't know about God's plan for restoration then. What I heard over the pulpit was about a Gentile prophet that was sent to bring God's word to a new generation, the Laodicean church age. And we've had some videos that talk about church ages. Um, but uh, what do message ministers preach in order to inform their assemblies that there is a requirement for a Gentile prophet today? Well, let's take a look here. We're going to look at Aaron McGreary. This is on the 23rd of February, 2020. We're going back a ways prophesied that we should receive the Gentile prophet. He's going to talk about Acts 3. Then we've got Tom Ray. This is the 30th of January 2022. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And then we've got, just very recently, Matt Morris. This is the 7th of January 2024. Bible would tell us that there's only one uh, only way the ways of God would ever be made known would be first revealed through a prophet of God. So we're going to look at those three videos and then come back. So here we go with those. So this puts us in the language that there's going to be a restoration of all things. Elijah shall surely come and restore all things. This was Jesus prophesying, and I'm really getting ahead of myself here. So now we see that in Acts chapter 3, this prophecy where Jesus says, Elijah shall truly, surely come and restore all things, is revived to the New Testament church that there's going to be a restitution of all things before Jesus Christ is revealed again. Let's turn to Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but revealeth his secrets unto his servant, the prophets. Is that, is that scripture? That's what you've heard over the years. The Lord will do nothing until first he receive, reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Is that true, Gabe? Is that true? That's what the Bible says. But here, David would write that God revealed his ways unto Moses. Paul would say God's ways are past finding out. But David said that God made known his ways unto Moses. Let me tell you, friends, what this is, is that God's ways are beyond our understanding. God's ways are past our searching, and, and it's past our digging. You can never be able to find it out. You can study all you want to. You'll never find the ways of God. You can dig all you want to. You can take the greatest ministers and the greatest theologians and the greatest pastors and Brother Mark, you can dig into the Word of God and you'll never find out the ways of God because the Bible would tell us that the only way the ways of God would ever be made known would be first revealed unto a prophet of God. Now let's talk about what scripture it is that they are referring to. 
okay? Let's talk about Amos chapter 3 first. Amos chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. If a ram's horn is blown in a city, aren't people afraid? If the disaster occurs in a city, hasn't the Lord done it? Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. So that's the, that's the scripture that, 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 we, that is referred to when they speak about these types of, these types of uh, events or these types of things. Then there's in Acts 3, we've got Peter, the, the apostle talking. He says, heaven must welcome him until the times of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your brothers. You must listen to him and everything he will say to you. Now, I'm going to repeat that again. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him and everything he will say to you. And everyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. In addition, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those after him have also announced these days. Now that's Peter. Have also announced these days. Have also announced these days. Okay? Let's remember that as we go through this video. Now before we speak about God's plan for restoration and new covenant, I want to address how these scriptures were taken completely out of context. This shouldn't shock anybody. This is what message ministers do. They take scriptures out of context. It isn't precept upon precept, line upon line. It's basically they take out a couple of verses and that's the proof that they need in order to be able to support their assertions or support their positions. But we'll take a look at that. First of all, let's talk about the book of Mo Amos. Who is the book of, what's the book of Moses, or excuse me, Amos about, and to whom was it written? Generally, if you look at scripture, the first verse of the first chapter tells us exactly who the book is written to. It's very helpful in that regard. Let's look at Amos, first chapter, first verse. The words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, what he said regarding Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Johash king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So we see in this verse that this, that, that this is written to the nation of Israel, the Jews. And, and in, in fact, if you take a look at the book of, uh, um, the book at, of uh, Amos, it was actually written by Amos 750 years prior to the birth of Christ. Amos was prophesying to the nation of Israel. He was scolding them about the behavior that they had towards one another. The, the Israelites at that time, the nation of Israel at that time, was taking the less well off and selling them into slavery and then taking the money and buying lavish things with it or buying comforts for themselves uh, at, at the price of these people who were less uh, advantaged or, or who, were, who were suffering or, or struggling. Now, in the third chapter of Amos, as a matter of fact, Amos is giving the nation of Israel the pure logic behind God's judgment. I'm going to start at verse 2 here. I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth, therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. And God's telling them, since I've only known you, I can only punish you. You are going to be punished for your iniquities because I only knew you. You are my nation, you're my people. So I will punish you because you have been my nation. Verse, verse 3, can two walk together without agreeing to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? Does a young lion growl from its lair unless it has captured something? In other words, you know, we, he's telling them that they have to come to some meeting, they have to come to some sort of an agreement or some sort of a, a point of, of agreement with, with God. Verse 5, does a bird land in a trap on the ground if there's no bait for it? Does a trap spring from the ground when it's caught nothing? So Amos is explaining the pure logic of God's judgment. In other words, God doesn't judge you unless something has occurred. God, does, God won't judge you unless there's something that you've done that's gone on. Now let's go to verse 6. If a ram's horn is blown in the city, aren't people afraid? Again, this goes back to him talking about the pure logic of God's judgment. If a disaster occurs in a city, hasn't the Lord done it? 
Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without really revealing his counsel to his servants. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who will not prophesy? So he's telling him, the prophets are going to tell you when you did something wrong. The reason he needs to do this, by the way, is because he is from the south of Israel. Amos is from the south of Israel. The people from the north, even though they knew that he was a true prophet, didn't take him seriously because he came from the south. So that was an issue that Amos had to deal with. That's why he basically was reminding them that he was a prophet of God in the, in the sixth and seventh verse. So we, we see that message ministers pluck a single verse or two verses out of the context of the entire chapter, and indeed, in this case, the entire book, to defend and justify William Branham as a prophet of God. What's important here? Why is it important? It's important because the book was written during a time when the nation of Israel was bound by the Mosaic Law. And we're going to talk at length about what the Mosaic Law is, and we're going to talk at length about some of the tenets of the Mosaic Law. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's take a moment and remind ourselves about what the Mosaic Law was. And I've left you a link down here. It's up here in the study notes as well. This is an article that was particularly interesting. It's written by thirdmill.org magazine. And it talks about the Mosaic Law very specifically. It says the Jews prided themselves on the Mosaic Law. The law, the, they were under it as the chosen people. The Mosaic Law was the law that was given to Moses. He came down with tablets with 10 of the 613 Mosaic Laws. There are 613 different tenets in the Mosaic Law. 613 laws and regulations according to which the Jewish nation attempted to live. Now notice I said attempted to live. I didn't say that they lived. Because, because the question is, were they successful? Were the Jews successful in being able to live up to it? Here's Third Mill again. This is the same article, but a little bit further down. It said, is it, an, it isn't enough to have this code hanging on your wall. Nor is it enough to subscribe to the law mentally. The question is, do you always obey it? And the, the, the answer always has to be no. See, God knew that they weren't going to live up to the Mosaic law, and that's why he gave them the opportunity for atonement with the high priest in the Holy of Holies with a sacrifice, because he knew that they were not going to be able to live up to the Mosaic law. So, so what are some of the laws of Moses? Well, I found a really great article here, Duke University here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the Duke Hall Gallery. Uh, this has, uh, there's a link in your description that'll give you all of the 613 mitzvot or laws. One of them is, as an example, don't cut your beard, okay? So, so here's Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. You are not to cut off the hair at the sides of your head or mar the edge of your beard. Don't cut your beard. So what I find interesting about that is if you go to Golden Dawn Tabernacle and the deacons don't believe that your, that your beard or that you're, you, you've got a little bit of a growth of beard, they take you into the bathroom or the restroom where there are razors and you shave yourself. Before you can, before you can enter the, the, the sanctuary, you have to give yourself a shave because the deacons don't think that, it's, that your beard is short enough here. The Mosaic Law says don't cut your beard which I find rather interesting. Here we have a, uh, one of the Mosaic laws that says maintaining a fringe on your clothes. This is Numbers, chapter 15, verses 37 through 40, starting at 37. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites. Tell, that, tell them that throughout the generations they are to make tassels for the corner of their garments and put a blue cord on the tassels at each corner. These will serve as tassels for you to look at so that you may remember all the Lord's commands and obey them and not become unfaithful by following your own heart and your own eyes. This way you will remember and obey all the commands and be holy to your God. Okay, so put maintaining fringes and tassels on your clothing is another one of the Mosaic laws. Here's another one of the 613 Mosaic laws. It says that release your Hebrew slaves every six years. So, 
obviously back in that time they had slaves. Now we think that's abhorrent and of course we do. And of course we, we can all agree that slavery is not the, a good thing. Slavery is a bad thing. But here we have the Mosaic Law that says if you've got Hebrew sleeve, slaves, release them every six years. This is Exodus chapter 21 verse 2. When you buy a Hebrew slave he is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh year he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. Okay, so you can release him without having him pay for his freedom. All right, here's an oldie but a goodie. Don't wear clothes of different cloth. And I find this one very interesting. This is Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11. Do not wear clothes made of both wool and linen. What I find interesting about that, obviously, is, you know, we have wool blends for suits. They, you know, linen and cottons and different materials with the wool blends for suits these days. We wear different shirts. We wear, you know, pants that are, you know, made out of out of uh, cotton. We make or twill, let's say, that's you know a wool blend, and then we have some sort of a polyester, some sort of a cotton rayon uh, mix on our on you know on our upper bodies. So we, you know, we this is. Do not wear clothes made by wool and linen. And in other words, don't mix cloth. All right. One of my personal favorites. This is what to do with a woman who is among you, those who you have conquered. Here we go. This is Deuteronomy 21, chapter 10 through 14. When you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you take some of them prisoner. And if you see a beautiful woman among the captives, desire her and want to take her as your wife, you're to bring her into your house. She must shave her head, trim her nails, Remove the clothes she was wearing when she was taking prisoner. Live at your house. Mourn for her father and mother a full month. And after that, you may have sexual relations with her and be her husband and she will be your wife. Then if you're not satisfied with, you, with her, you are to let her go where she wants. But you must not sell her for money or treat her as merchandise because you have humiliated her. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting. So, and it's interesting in that we don't, take captives among the people that we go to war with. Um, we, don't, we don't hold hostages. We don't do that sort of thing. And we certainly don't treat them like this. We see that, however, in the October 7th, we see the Palestinians who did that, who had, who raped the Israelis that they, you know, in their towns or, you know, the hostages and those sorts of things. So, but I, but I think it's an interesting, it, that's one of, it's why it's one of my favorites today. It's reminiscent to me of what the, is what the uh, Palestinians did uh, with the women who were in Israel on October 7th, but I digress. But Tim, I hear, we don't do these things anymore. Own slaves? How ridiculous. That's right. That, that, and that's the point. Here we have James, the second chapter, verse 10. For whoever keeps the entire law, yet fails in one point, is guilty of breaking it all. So if we, as it, let me give you an example. If, if you are told you have to keep your hair long, that's a Mosaic law thing, okay? It, it, women, keep your hair long. That, that's from the Mosaic law. It's not from the New Testament, by the way but it's from the, right? So if you keep your hair long and you cut your hair, then you diminish the entire Mosaic law. But you see, the thing is, we're not under the Mosaic law. We're not bound to the Mosaic law. James tells us here that keeping the, the Mosaic law, we're guilty of breaking the entire law. We don't have we, we don't have the full liberty in Jesus Christ if we obey the, the, the law. And here we have the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians, 5th chapter, verses 3 through 6. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to keep the entire law. Let me read that again. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to, to keep the entire law. Now, Paul is talking about... The, the disagreement that he and Peter were having and the other disciples were having about whether or not men who were converted to Christianity were to, or the Gentiles who came to Christianity should be circumcised. Paul is telling them here, if you get circumcised, you're bound to the entire law. Now, naturally today, we get circumcised for different reasons. It's a health, it's a, it's a, 
uh, matter of cleanliness is it's you know it's a matter there, there's all sorts of health reasons or all sorts of practical reasons why people get circumcised today and we're not following the entire law but at the but here Paul is telling them but, but you know guys if you force people to get circumcised then they are bound to the entire law back in those days you're trying to be justified by the law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You who are trying to keep your hair a certain length are alienated from Christ because you're following the Mosaic law. You've fallen from grace. For though the Spirit by faith through the Spirit by faith we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Here Paul tells us in no uncertain terms, the law will not give you the liberty through Jesus Christ. Faith through the Spirit, faith is what gives us Jesus Christ, and that's how we, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, not through obeying legalisms or the law. Now back to our discussion about restoration and the new covenant. We're, we're told that God does not change his ways. Is that true? Well, let's take a look at scripture. Here we have the Hebrews that's constantly repeated by message ministers. You all know this. This is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we've seen message ministers teach that over and over and over again. They even have banners and put it up in their churches, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So William Branham said it constantly, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, which is how he justified as an example using Amos 3.7 as justification for him being a Gentile prophet of God. But here we have, so, so why isn't the old covenant relationship still in effect? You see, if we have these laws, if we have these 1613 tenets of the Mosaic Law, why aren't we still using them? I left a link for an article here. It's called Bible Answers Study. It's a lesson in the Bible Answers on BibleAnswers.study. It's a really good study of, of the Mosaic Law, but let's go directly to Scripture and why we're not doing it anymore. Let's go to directly to Scripture. Here's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. Look, the days are coming. The days are coming. Now listen, God had in his mind, he knew that the nation of Israel could not live up to the 1613 or the 613 tenets of the Mosaic Law. That's why he gave them an opportunity for atonement through, atonement through sacrifice with the high priest in the Holy and Holies, Holy of Holies. God knew that that wasn't going to be what it was going to be in the end. God knew that that was not going to suffice in order to bring people back to himself. Okay, So here we have Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah is telling us exactly why that's true Okay, or how that's true. Here he says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's referring here to Jesus Christ being of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, this isn't going to be the old covenant relationship. He took them out of the hand, took them by the hand, took them out of Egypt. Moses gave them the 613 tenets of the Mosaic law. This is not going to be like that covenant, God says. A covenant they broke even though I married them, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make on the house of Israel after these days. So he's referring to a future time, after these days. The Lord's declaration, I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, this is the Lord's declaration, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. See, that was not the case in the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant relationship, sins had to be atoned for. What God is telling us in chapter or in verse 34 is 
that in the new covenant, when we come to a realization, when we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he will not remember our sin. I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. So we have an entirely different relationship. Did God change? No. What this tells us is God knows that the relationship that he had in the Old Covenant relationship in the Mosaic Law wasn't going to reconcile his people back to him. And he needed a way to reconcile God's people back to God. And that's the part, that's the restoration that we talk about so frequently. When was the new covenant ushered in by Jesus Christ? Let's take a look. Matthew 27, verse 50 through 51. Jesus shouted again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. The earthquake and the rocks split. Now why is this an important scripture? Why is it important that the, that the curtain in the tabernacle split from top to bottom? The curtain in the tabernacle was the thing that separated God's people from the Holy of Holies. You could not enter the curtain in the tabernacle unless you were the high priest. Okay? If, if you did, you would die. That, so, right? so when, when Jesus Christ dies here and the curtain in the tabernacle tears from top to bottom, it exposes God to everyone. Okay? A new covenant. We now have a direct relationship with God through Jesus Christ ushering in a new covenant. That's why this scripture is so, so, so important. We are, because that tearing of the curtain relieves us from the old covenant where the only way we could enter into a relationship with God was through the high priest in the Holy of Holies or through specific instructions, that specific commissions given to the prophets of God. This is, this is really, really critical to understanding it. And it happened at the moment that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's why this is so, so, so important. This is why when Jesus entered in a new covenant, then we've got Paul again talking to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. Now, if the ministry of death, he calls the ministry of death, see, ministry of death chiseled in letters on stone. That is to say, the old covenant laws chiseled on the tablets, in letters on the tablets of stone. If the ministry of death, the law of Moses, the laws, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory. That is, if, you were glory, if, if there was glory in following the Mosaic law so that the Israelites were not able to look directly at Moses' face because of the glory from his face, a faded glory, how will the ministry of spirit not be more glorious? We end the ministry of death, that is, we end the Mosaic Law, we enter the ministry of the Spirit, the one-on-one -on -one relationship through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that, Jesus, that, that was promised to us and, and arrived at the day of Pentecost. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, and the Mosaic Law was all about condemnation, Oh, look at that. You did something wrong. You're condemned. Oh, you did. Look at that. You're not. Oh, you did that. You have to atone for your sins. Oh, it was all about condemnation. So if the, minist if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. And this is important because we see Paul right here talks about the ministry of condemnation in the old covenant relationship. So when we see somebody and we say, boy, if you're wearing pants, you're not, you're not saved. That's condemnation. That's a ministry of condemnation. If you're wearing pants, you're not saved. If you cut your hair, if you even question Donnie Reagan, the, 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 the Facebook post that I put out a couple of weeks ago, Donnie Reagan, if, you know, hey, look, don't question cutting your hair. And if you would question cutting your hair, you're cut off from your social group. You, you, obviously, that's just not a good thing. They have the right to abandon you or avoid you, avoid you in Donnie Reagan's terminology. They have the right to basically shun you or cast them out of their social circle. That's why this is important, because the ministry of condemnation is the old covenant relationship, but it's also what we see in the message 
constantly over and over and over again. If you're not in the message, you're not going in the rapture. The ministry of condemnation, that's what we have today inside of the message. Here Paul says the ministry of condemnation is nothing. And the, the, the ministry that we have, the ministry of righteousness, overflows with even more glory. But what about Acts chapter 3? Because that's one of the verses that was brought up in, by the ministry. Uh, and, and so what about Acts chapter 3? Well, let's take a look at what they're talking about here. This is Acts chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Heaven must welcome him until the times of the restoration of all things. Now this is really, really an important verse because this, you see, message ministers will tell you that the restoration of all things hasn't ha ha happened only when William Branham arrived, okay? But here, let's take a look at it. Heaven must welcome him until the times of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. And this is their justification. You see, the, the restoration of all things happened only when William Branham showed up and it was ushered in by the prophet who was William Branham. What the apostles, what Peter's telling us here is that the, we're, we're hanging on to Jesus Christ the, the, until the times of the restoration of all things. We're going to talk about how that was restored or what the restoration of all things actually took place. And we're also going to talk about God spoke about, God did speak about, you remember the Jeremiah, God did, did speak about the mouth of it through the holy uh, prophets from the beginning. Okay? He knew that he was going to change their covenant relationship. And he knew that, that, was, that he was going to restore things. Moses said, Moses said, The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him and everything he will say to you. Moses said, in the Mosaic law, we just saw where the Mosaic law, that is the law of death, the ministry of death, right, the ministry of condemnation, the Mosaic law, is no longer, Paul tells us, we now have a ministry of righteousness. Okay? Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything you will say. And everyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. In addition, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those after him have also announced these days. Remember in Jeremiah where he talked about future, where he talked about in the days to come, in the following days, in the later days, later on is in Jeremiah. Here we have Peter talking to about these days. In addition, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those after him have also announced these days. Peter's telling us here that these days were already here in the days of Pentecost, in the days when, when the disciples were planning churches and preaching. In the days of their ministry, okay, the Mosaic Law is passed, and now we have a, a new covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Peter says, in these days, have announced these days. So Moses said, old covenant relationship. All the prophets announced these days. These are different days. These days. These, these are the days of the new covenant relationship that Jeremiah talked about when he talked about those being future days for Jeremiah. Peter confirms that these are these days. That is, that relationship has changed. That covenant relationship with God has shifted. And you see, this is the problem with message ministers. They, they either start too late in Scripture or they end too soon. When they teach scripture, they, they, and, and, it's, and it's a shame because when they start that way, uh, they really, they miss the opportunity. Uh, they miss the, the, the entire boat. They basically don't have a handle on the, on the, new, the, the new covenant relationship. And so they can't take advantage of the new co covenant relationship. They stay in the ministry of condemnation. They stay in the old covenant relationship with, with God. And, and that Jesus, so they minimize the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you stay in the law of Moses, then Christ died for nothing. And, and that's the point. That's the critical issue. If, you know, don't cut your hair, wear long skirts, 
you know, men, you know, do certain things, behave in a certain way. That, you know, that old covenant relationship was great for what it was, couldn't live up to it, needed atonement through the Holy and Holies. Are the message ministers going to atone for sins by sacrificing it for us? I mean, right? They're the, they're the high priests, it's supposedly the high priest. What, when, when are they sacrificing things? When is their day of atonement for, to sacrifice for sins if we're supposed to follow the old covenant relationship? And according to Paul, if you follow one covenant, one part of the Mosaic law, you got to follow it all. So, now let's talk about the the discussion until the time of restoration of all things. That's really a key component of Acts chapter three. Pay careful attention here. The message hinges on the notion of the restoration of all things, and and the message ministers talk frequently. They conclude that this period is of time is a future event. That is the the event when William Branham showed up. You see, he was the one who would come and restore all things when Jesus Christ would return. The, the, and so he talks, and that there were two periods of restoration: one when Jesus died on the cross, and the other one when William Branham shows up. They'll explain that William Branham came to restore all things in mention, as mentioned in Acts chapter 3. But what does scripture say? Let's take a look at that. Here we have the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. So the disciples question him. They're talking about questioning Jesus Christ. So, so why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Notice the words that they use. Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus' response is revealing in that he's, he's repeating back to them the scripture that they said. This is Jesus speaking in verse 11. Elijah is coming and restore everything and will restore everything. See, he's repeating it back in the context that the, that the question was asked. Okay, He's not projecting a new future. Well, how do I know that? Because it says right here, Elijah is coming and will restore everything everything he replied but I tell you Elijah has already come so he's repeating back to the disciples that Elijah will come and restore everything because they asked why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first well Elijah must come to restore everything yeah that's right yeah that's what the scribes say but I tell you Jesus Christ says Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him on the contrary, they did whatever they, they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. So we see here that the Elijah that was spoken about is John the Baptist. Jesus tells us that very, very clearly in Matthew 17, chapter, or chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. It's indisputable here. Elijah has already come, Jesus Christ says. Wow, unbelievable. So what was restored when Jesus Christ sacrificed for us on the cross? Well, let's take a look. Here's Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took a man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Here's also Genesis 2, chapter 24 and 25. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. In that period of time, in Genesis, when they were in the garden, God had perfect communion with the man. God had perfect communion with Adam and Eve. They would walk with him, they would talk with him, they'd work the fields, they would do all of this. They didn't have any knowledge of, of wrongdoing or doing anything wrong. Even though they were naked, they didn't feel any shame about it. Now, this relationship was broken. This relationship was severed. Let's figure it out here. Genesis 3 chapter 3 verses 8 through 13 then then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze we know this story this is after the fall this is after Eve uh, you know sinned and got Adam to sin and then they began to understand that they were naked and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden so the Lord called out to the man and said where are you and he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? At that moment, the relationship is severed. God here used to say, hey, where are you, he says. 
And Adam replies, I heard you in the garden. They're communicating one-on-one. -on -one. They have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. That's severed right here. The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord asked the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, it was a serpent. He deceived me and I ate. Now, you know the story. God at that point then cast him out of the, the garden. And, and now that ends the one-on-one -on -one relationship with God that they had. What happens when the curtain is torn from top to bottom? How did the sacrifice of Jesus restore the relationship? The curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. We have restoration of that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God that ended at the fall of man. It's restored here when Jesus dies. So why is it that message ministers don't recognize the new covenant? Why is it that they teach the covenant of condemnation? Why is it message ministers refuse to accept what Jesus Christ himself revealed to the, to the disciples about John the Baptist and his ministry to restore all things? Why is it that they don't follow that? And that's a really important thing. Why is it message ministers don't accept that everything was restored when the relationship between God and his people became personal, the one-on-one -on -one relationship again? It became intimate again, God and his people directly. And why is it message ministers insist on holding the people of their assemblies to the Mosaic Law, but only part of the Mosaic Law? You see, this is the biggest problem. They hold you to only part of the Mosaic law, but they don't offer you like God did. God offered you at least an opportunity to, to, uh, you know, to redeem yourself through the, you know, the sacrifice in the Holy Holies to atone for your sins. Our message minister is going to help you atone for your sins, but they hold you to the old covenant. They hold you to the Mosaic law. They hold you to the law of condemnation. So how are they going to restore? How are they going to give you, you know, to, to let you atone for your sins? Are they going to go sacrifice animals in, on your behalf for the atonement of your sins? Of course not. So, so why are they holding you into the Mosaic Law, into the, into the ministry of condemnation? And they do. That's what the message is all about. It is a ministry of condemnation. And remember, if you follow one of the Mosaic Laws, you're bound to all of them. Right? So, so let's wrap this up. What are the conclusions? Who restored all things? Was it William Branham? No. It was Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, the tabernacle, the curtain in the tabernacle was torn from top to bottom. Now we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship was uh, restored. He re Jesus Christ restored all things. And to say that somebody else had to come and restore all things, that is William Branham had to do that, minimizes that sacrifice that Jesus Christ made to restore all things and to usher in a new covenant. Second thing, are we to continue to live in the old covenant instead of the new covenant, which was ushered in by Jesus Christ? No, no. We have full liberty in salvation through Jesus Christ. It is the, the relationship of, or the, the covenant of righteousness, not the covenant of condemnation. When we're held to even a single part of the Mosaic law through legalism and regulation, we're responsible, according to the Apostle Paul and James, for the entire Mosaic law. Was it important in the Old Covenant for a prophet of God to interact with the people? Of course it was, because that was the one of the only two ways that the nation of Israel had to interact with God, through, through the Holy of Holies and the High Priest, and through specific commissions to the prophets of God uh, that were given by the true prophets that were given by, G, by God, right? Is that important in the New Covenant? Is, does the New Covenant relationship... Uh, require a prophet? No, because he's given us a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't have to have that. When we, when, when message ministers say that there's a prophet required, a human intercessor between God and his people, he minimizes the death of Jesus Christ on the cross who died to eliminate those requirements. That, that's no longer a requirement. When the new covenant was ushered in, did the old covenant relation pass away, relationship pass away? Of course it did. Just like Jeremiah said in the Old Testament, 
When message ministers teach Old Covenant legalism and implement standards based on the Old Covenant relationship, they minimize the death of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice to usher in a New Covenant relationship. We are not bound by the Old Covenant relationship, an intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship between God and his people has been restored. There is no requirement for a Gentile prophet. So because we know that, who is William Branham? Okay, we're all done. I just wanted to share that with everybody today. I know it's been a while since I put out a video. We've had a lot of things to do here. And I, and I tried to put out some interesting uh, posts on Facebook as well. We'll continue to, to post those things as well. So listen, God bless everybody. I sure hope you're having a great 2024. Welcome to the New Covenant Relationship. Welcome to not being under the, the covenant of condemnation, okay? Welcome for, to being in the covenant of righteousness. We love you guys. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you now. Bye-bye.